too poor to give or too rich to receive. That is a quote from Dave Toyson's published book, The Power of Generosity. And that statement is a wonderful summary of Dave's impact. As president and chief executive officer of World Vision Canada, Dave Toyson heads the country's largest humanitarian relief and development agency. A Canadian citizen, uh, Toyson holds degrees in philosophy and divinity and has received three honorary doctorates. In his 25 years as leader of World Vision Canada, 17 of them as president, donations have increased to more than $415 million annually. The number of children sponsored through World Vision Canada has also risen to more than a half a million, which in turn touches and changes families and communities that number into the millions. Dave has led the agency into significant advocacy and public policy work, and with an emphasis on issues that affect children. He has spoken before the World Bank, has met with heads of state, key global executives, and development leaders to discuss the well-being of the world's children. Dave's career with World Vision internationally has spanned more than 40 years. His leadership, I can testify, is truly servant-hearted, as he seeks to engage the church in Canada and every Canadian to become more engaged in serving the poor and the vulnerable and to develop a more generous way of life. Now, why does Dave do this? Well, the answer is sub summed up in six words, for children, for change, for life. Let's welcome Dave Toyson. Well, it's wonderful to be with you uh, tonight, today. It's uh, just marvelous to be here. Uh, I, first of all, just want to say thank you for all your engagement uh, already. Uh, it's just, we're so appreciative, and of course, for children and families, it just makes all the difference in the world. So thank you so much for doing that. Uh, I'm also just so grateful. You, you're generous. You've allowed us to steal some of the time of your pastor to be on our board. And I just want you to know that uh, this would be no surprise to you at all, but Dave is a, an incredibly engaged uh, participant in our board meetings, and it's always a delight when he's with us, and we appreciate his wisdom. He's been an especially strong coach, as you can imagine, on our engaging with churches across Canada. So, uh, Dave, I just want to say thank you and to your family for giving you up uh, on a few weekends here and there to be with World Vision. So I uh, just want to say thank you. I also want to acknowledge, I've got a couple of colleagues here, Mike standing back there and Leanne, who are going to be helping me out afterwards if you have any questions. Um, they probably have, they might have better answers than I do. So uh, I encourage you uh, to uh, talk with them. They'll be at the table with uh, the picture folders if you'd like to choose to uh, sponsor children. Well, the, the title that I've chosen for tonight is Becoming a Global Christian. Actually, Dave suggested that, but I, I think it's a really good idea, so it wasn't hard to agree to, to address that topic. And, and I'm challenged by this. So first of all, what do we mean by a global Christian? You know, does it mean, for example, um, I don't know, you, uh, you got a map somewhere in your house of the world? I mean, that's not a bad thing. That'd be good. Or does it mean you're really careful about you know, reading the international stories in the newspaper. Or I guess if you really want to show your sophistication, you read The Economist, okay? Or let's see, what else? Or maybe, uh, like in my case, I grew up, I had a grandmother. My dad's mother was just a passionate, mission-minded Christian. It was, she was always trying to find a little bit more money to give to missions. She didn't want to spend it on herself. She, in that's one way I think you can, and she was a prayer warrior, prayed all the time for missionaries overseas, and of course it had a tremendous impact on me. So that's kind of something about what we mean by global. Now, looking in Scripture, it seems to me as you look at, particularly starting with the Old Testament, God didn't just create uh, human beings to be Israel, God created everybody in this world. So I suppose in some ways it's pretty obvious if you're going to be a global Christian, you've got to think about everybody. Uh, and from the beginning, uh, the prophet Isaiah, uh, 42nd chapter, 6th verse, he talks about Israel being a light to the nations. So that even, even the Jewish people were to be a light to the world. It wasn't just about them. It was about what are you doing for the rest of the world? That's, that's the way the story begins. That's the canvas 
that God has when he's talking to us about the world. However, and I think this is true for us even in churches today, sometimes, and this happened to the Israelites a lot, you move from mission to survival, and it drives you inward. And so you worry more about yourself, and you worry more about your sort of, quote, purity than you do about reaching out and, frankly, being uncomfortable. And that happened big time. Now, I think we have to have some sympathy for this. If you look at the Israelites, they were being pounded on, persecuted, killed, time after time. But it still seems to me God was saying to them, you're still to be a light to the nations. Even when you're in Egypt, even when you're captured, you're to be a light to the nations. One of my favorite books in the Old Testament is Jonah. Oh dear, I've got to take this watch off if I'm ever going to stay on time. Sorry, forgive me for this. This is what I'm supposed to do at the beginning. So it, it, the Jonah story is so interesting. Do you remember the story? It's, we think of it as a whale, but it's supposed to be a big fish. He's an evangelist, right? He's supposed to spread the message. He's a prophet, and he doesn't want to go. Uh, he just doesn't want to go there. And so God, I'm not going to go into the whole story because I don't have time. I'm hoping you remember most of the details. But you remember he gets thrown overboard. He's swallowed by a fish. We can't understand how this could all work, but it's an incredible story. He gets coughed up, and he reluctantly goes off to Nineveh. And this is where the story, I think, gets especially interesting. Nineveh was one of the most cruel superpowers of its age. Their, the terror and havoc they wrought on people, their in, unjust behavior, their idolatry was legendary. And if you remember the story, Jonah says, okay, I'll go tell him the message. But then he gets really mad because they actually repent. They actually repent and, and before God. It says they even put uh, sackcloth, a sign of repentance on their animals. And, and this, so this story just comes out of kind of nowhere in the Old Testament. And the closing, the closing message in the book, the last verse, it just kind of ends abruptly. And Jonah is so mad, he says to God, I knew I shouldn't go there because you were going to change your mind and be soft. You're not going to wipe them out like you're supposed to. And then God says to him, he says, there are what? Hundreds of thousands who don't know their right hand from the left. And then get this, and many animals. It just sits there. Once again, I believe it's the prophet reminding us we're to be global people. We're to think about everyone that God has created. They have a place in God's concern for the world. So if you'll, you'll give me some grace here, I'm arguing if we're going to be global Christians, we've got to be concerned about the world. Then the next part, it seems to me, okay, but we're supposed to be Christian. So what does it mean to be a global Christian? And I would, I would suggest to you that's where it gets a bit more demanding, I think. It's one thing to have sort of a picture of the world, but now how are we supposed to behave? It's more than just thinking about the world or thinking about other people. We have to practice this whole business of what I like to call the whole gospel. This idea, what, what did Jesus say? This is where we move to the New Testament. Jesus says you're supposed to love God and love your neighbor. That's what he, that's what he told the fellow who asked him that question. So when you become a global Christian, or if you are practicing as a global Christian, we're going to bring that message. And it takes you to some pretty uncomfortable places. I don't know. This is, I was trying to think of a, a recent event uh, in, in the world. Uh, and I was, I'm sorry, I'm drawn to the United States. I, I don't know if you, I read in the paper yesterday, I think, about the, the, the young man that's, a, that's dead from Chechen, from Chechnya, who's accused of doing the bombing. And they've taken his body to a funeral home because I think there's going to probably be an autopsy, whatever. And the people in that area are absolutely irate, irate over this. And I was just thinking, now, I think a global Christian might look at that a little bit differently. Even though he's most likely guilty of these crimes, he's still one of God's children. And how do we behave around God's children, even a dead one? He has a mother. He has a father. Confused. They've been con there's been controversy around them. I would suggest to you, if you're going to be a global Christian, you, your heart need, you need to be drawn into those sort of things. You ought to be asking some questions. I'm not sure what's exactly the right thing, because I'm sitting here in Canada. I'm not in Massachusetts. But I have a feeling that if Jesus were here, 
I don't think Jesus would be arguing and screaming, we need to get his body back to Chetnia, get him out of here. We don't want him here. When instead it's an opportunity to bear witness to faith and grace and love. Now the parable of the Good Samaritan just illustrates, I think, how uncomfortable the situation can be for us sometimes. You know the story. It's, it's such a class, but it's so powerful. Remember, the man's beaten. This is a story, by the way. Jesus, we don't have any evidence that Jesus is telling a true story. We presume he's using this as an illustration, as a parable. The man's beaten by the roadside, and two important religious figures march by and don't do anything. And I, I was thinking about this. I don't know, but I've heard some creative interpretations. One of my favorite was from a, a guy in the southern United States named Clarence Jordan. And he tells the story. Uh, it's, it's quite humorous, but also very powerful. He's talking about this is a man living in the 60s in that time. And he tells the story. The, guy, the first guy coming down the road is the song leader. Because if you're going to have a church service, you've got to have a song leader. He passes by. And then the preacher shows up, but he's got a white suit on. He's all ready to do his preaching, and he doesn't want to get it dirty. So he marches by. Who do you think is the third guy? Anybody? Anybody heard this story? What would you guess? Think the context. Deep South, huh? He's a black man. He's a black man driving along in an old beat-up pickup truck. And he does just as the story that Jesus tells. He stops, and he ministers to the person. Now, you remember in the Bible, it's a Samaritan. And the Samaritans were sort of second-class Jewish people because they veered away on, on some doctrinal points. So when Jesus is using this guy, <laughs> I think it's really powerful because this guy is an outsider. He's not an insider. He's outside being a good Jewish man of the good Jewish community. And also, he's not really in his own geography. He's kind of traveling in a place where he's, he's likely to be under some threat because of the context of the other side that's bigger and stronger. And, and yet he's the person who has the courage to do this. Now, you seem like a fairly open congregation, so I'm going to push this a little bit harder. I, here's what I was thinking about. Maybe today, in light of some of the controversy, if Jesus were telling the story today, he might say it was a gay Christian man walking down the road that did this, just to kind of punch us a little bit, kind of go at us where our biases are. N.T. Wright, one of my favorite theologians, when he looks at this passage, this is what he says. <clears throat> I think we've got it on the screen. He's talking now about this passage. What is at stake then and now is the question of whether we will use the God-given revelation of love and grace as a way of boosting our own sense of isolated security or purity, or whether we will see it as a call and a challenge to extend that love and grace to the whole world. It's a great summary statement, I think, of what Jesus is saying. So we're all underneath God's big, what I like to call God's big umbrella, the, the kingdom of God. We're all under that. So it doesn't matter whether we're school teachers, business people, farmers, world vision workers. We're all part of that total response that Jesus wants to give to the world. And each of us will have to work out our expression, both globally and locally in our context. How are we going to love our neighbor? How are we going to love God? And the whole gospel's not just about spiritual poverty, which, of course, is in many ways is at the center of the call, but it's also about physical, economic, and emotional poverty as well. And this church, you are, you are involved in that. You're responding that way. So we're called, we're called to go to the poor, go to the other cultures, go to other places in the world, other places in our own community. It's so critical for us. Now, I, I want to, this is stuff that, probably you're quite familiar with, but let me just for a moment then talk about, so what does that world that we're looking at, whether we're looking at the outside, say, marginal places in your community here where there's people suffering from poverty, whether we look at Canada or whether we look all over the world. Three, three statistics, just to kind of, you're, you've heard some of this before, but I think it's a good reason. Seven million children dying each year. The good news is in 1990, it was almost 12 million. 
So we're making progress. But there's still 7 million children under 5 dying from things like diarrhea, malaria, pneumonia. Simple things we know how to fix. There's 250 million children who are in what we call dirty and dangerous jobs in the world. And many of them will not go to school because of that. And terrible things happen to them. And then lastly, 61 million children who still aren't in school. And that's so significant because education changes so much for everybody. Some of the strongest statistics, for example, are the changes when girls go to school. Girls who will become mothers and the impact that has in their family. And as you probably all know here, the most discriminated when it comes to education is girls. Good news, that is changing. But still, that number. Then this next slide, is, it's a bit of a... Uh, just read the big print on it here. This is a look at natural disasters back in 2011. And you'll, the top print says, per year in the 90s, we were natural disasters averaged around $20 million per year. And in 2000, from about what, 2000 and, uh, to 2010, $100 billion a year. It's just off the charts of how disasters are facing our world. Why do I say that? Most, most, the, the most people that are affected by natural disaster are the poor people because they live on marginal land, they don't have safety, and they die in much greater numbers. So when you think about this global thing we're trying to deal with, it's challenging. There are so many aspects to it. Quickly, just to, to personalize this a bit, this is just a, uh, it's a little boy named, he's Victor. He's living on a mattress in, Bol in Bolivia that he shares with his sisters and his father. Their mother left them years ago, and since the father can't afford a proper house, the family lives in a small room attached to the local school. That's the, you know, we can tell stories about that in Laos, all over the world. Parents, kids living at the edge of survival. This next one is a bit of a, it's both, uh, concerning, but it's also a positive story. I was in Afghanistan last year. We're doing work in Afghanistan in the midst of all the difficulties there. And I went into a hospital where World Vision has provided the really the only newborn uh, maternal care unit of any hospital in the city of Herat. This is a city in the west. And while I was there, a new baby had just been born, and I was getting the tour, and it was wonderful, but all of a sudden, this little guy in the picture, he just stopped breathing. And if you've ever been around a hospital maternity ward and a baby stops breathing, I mean, it all breaks loose. We didn't have that many staff. We had two staff, but they just were on this little guy like crazy, the nurse as well as the doctor. And they started re resuscitating. And the good news in after, it's, you know, it seemed to me like he wasn't breathing for five minutes, but it was probably more like a minute or 45 seconds. And then he started breathing again. And he's alive today. He's healthy. I saw his auntie take him out of the hospital with the with because uh, the mother couldn't leave at that point uh, and he was he was healthy and fine however Afghanistan has some of the worst statistics it's it has the highest mortality rate in the world one out of every 73 women giving birth will die because of of they just don't have proper medical care it's the highest statistic in the world and one out of every five children will die before the age of five that's, that's the environment. One of the things we're doing is working with mothers and teenage girls who actually we train and they become, they become health workers in their communities to help them understand. One of the worst practices to just give you, I'd never encountered this before, and I don't think it's across Afghanistan, but it was in one tribal group. When the mothers give birth to their babies, they have a kind of cultural taboo that the breast milk from the mother for the first two or three days is dirty and shouldn't be given to the babies. Can you imagine just what that does in terms, because it isn't only nutrition, but it's also the immunities that protect babies when they're born. So that's what we're up against. But the good news is we're making some progress. Now, you, you've heard a lot about World Vision, so I'll probably go through this quickly. But I, uh, So what I want to talk about is just how it all sort of fits together. And let me just go to... so. He, I wish there was just one thing we had to do at World Vision that would deal, would solve all this. I wish there was one, the language is one silver bullet. You know, if we just gave everybody clean water, 
or if we just made sure every child was going to school, that would fix it. But it doesn't work that way. And, we, and we've learned that. We've learned that. Our, our vision statement, our vision for every child, life in all its fullness, our prayer for every heart, the will to make it so. That's our, our summary statement. We call it child well-being. That's what drives us. Doesn't mean we don't care about parents or we don't care about the community, but we're saying in the end we want to measure the impact on children. So it means we, have to, we must work with parents, we must work with the community. So I, I call this, just to make the point, I call this kind of the response ladder. So, the, so if, you were, if we're going out into a community, the first thing we might say, okay, kids are hungry, so we have to get them food. Great. So we do that. We work on the food piece. And then somebody says, but are you helping them with agriculture so they can grow their own food? So then we move into that, food and agriculture. Ah, but then somebody says, they still have dirty water. They're still getting diarrhea. Kids are still dying from that. Okay, so we bring in, we drill wells. And we also work on sanitation. Because if you don't have sanitation in the community, the, the water will probably be polluted and kids will still be getting sick. So we do that. Then the next piece is <clears throat> health care. Because somebody's going to say, well, what do you do when the kids are sick? Yeah, they've got clean water. Yes, they've got latrines. Yes, they're getting food. But what happens when they're sick? So we have to work on health care. And it isn't as simple as providing clinics because that's not really very... People can't always get to clinics. So you, we use voluntary health workers who go around and spread the message how to protect yourself from AIDS, what to do if you're HIV positive, what to do if a, if a baby ha has diarrhea, gets dehydrated just need really simple solution that you can keep that baby hydrated so they don't die. So we do that. But then somebody says, yeah, but if they're not educated, if, they're, if there isn't literacy, I talked about this earlier, you got another problem. So we get involved in education. And then, of course, somebody says, yeah, but are you actually increasing the livelihood of the families? Are you actually helping the family? Because they want to look after their own kids. They're happy to have some help from us, but actually they want to look after their own kids. So then we do things like microfinance. That means little, small, tiny, sometimes it's loans of 2 or $3. We would laugh at this here. It's so minute. It, it's, it, can it can change a family incredibly. So they'll use the loan to get animals, for example. Better seed for agriculture. Uh, maybe they start a small business. Little tailor shops. Or uh, I see this oftentimes. Women setting up roadside stands to sell food. Even prepared meals. So we do that. But then... People might say, yes, but you're doing good work in the community, but there's corruption in the country. Uh, people don't know their rights. The politicians aren't being challenged. So, so then we move into this next piece, advocacy. And, you, and some of the most powerful advocates are children. We, we now, in most of our project, by the way, Laos, your work there is fantastic, but that's one of the toughest places in the world because it's a country where the government does not want human rights. So it's really challenging. But what we do is we especially start with children so that they, they form little communities and march around. They'll take on the mayors. They're quite fearless. They don't have the baggage of us old people like me. <laughs> they just do it. So, and we're doing that because we're saying you have to change the framework or you'll have, you might help the community, but you've got a glass ceiling above it that will never get better because there's so much injustice in the country. This is obviously the toughest thing to do. Because it's it inevitably it get, can get be it's political and it threatens people, and then of course we're doing all of this as part of an expression of experiencing the love of Christ, and of course depending on the context, in some countries in the world that we work, we never apologize that we're Christian. They know we're Christian, but we work in countries, for example, that are Islamic republics, so we we're not allowed in any way to do proclamation work. We can't. If we can do it, we'll be thrown out of the country immediately. So it has to be, it's our presence there. How do we provoke the question, why are you here? I've had that expression, I remember talking to one of our Indian colleagues being in a village that was totally of another faith. And after our people had been there, because our people there, they come with their kids and live in the community with these poor people. And inevitably, what happens is they say, why are you here? Because if we were in your place, we'd get out of here as fast as we could. And our staff say, well, we're here because we love Jesus and we love you. And that's why we're here. In Mauritania, in West Africa, we were working in Islamic Republic. I was talking to one of our former leaders there. And this was during after 9-11. Things were really tense. And he was thinking that, that he was being, even our, some of our leadership was saying, it's, you, you really can't work there. 
we, we, you really need to think about leaving the country. So our leader was really torn by this. He wanted to stay, so he went to see the imam, the senior cleric in the, in the city. He asked to see him, and the imam said, I'll come and see you. He hadn't seen him before. He came to the World Vision office, and our leader said to him, he explained you know, the dilemma here, safety issues, the political situation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the imam said to him, he said, listen, our people care about people because we make them. We force them to because, because our, 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 our Islamic structure says you have to do this. He said, your people are here because you love our poor. Don't go. You stay here and help our people learn to love the poor. Amazing what can happen in places where you'd think nothing, there'd be no witness or there'd be no presence. Next slide here uh, is Vang Fei. I've just got a, a list. I don't think I need to really say much about it other than that. Say thank you again. And once again, just to affirm to you how courageous it is, because you could take on communities anywhere in the world. I understand that. You could take on a community in a much easier environment. But I want to tell you, this is really courageous. We've got a wonderful uh, Canadian who's acting as director in that country. And I can tell you right now, they've had some troubles. We can't go public with it. Uh, but, but just issues around people being sick uh, and a sense of spiritual power that's been really quite destructive. And we've been praying for them. And I just got a note back from her about a week ago saying things are much better and the Lord has answered prayers. Our most senior leaders, two of our most senior leaders in the World Vision Partnership have just been there to encourage her and work with her in an environment that's incredibly challenging. All right, so if we're going to be a global Christian, i get this watch out again or I'm going to be in trouble. Uh, in our, the, other, the other thing about being a global Christian, I th- you know, the Bible talks about mercy. You know, in Micah 6, 8, it says love mercy, but it then says practice justice. Justice. And there's a difference between mercy and justice. Mercy is helping people, or we being helped, and we don't deserve it in any way. Justice, and the best example of it is, is when we behave the way we have and and the way we've broken our relationship with God, that's a matter of us being unjust, unjust towards our creator. That's the basis of justice in the Bible. So we have to look this way. And so, for example, that injustice can only be righted, according to Scripture, by Jesus' sacrifice for us. That's how it's changed. When we look at justice and injustice from a human point of view, it's a violation of someone's legitimate rights. And so we have to be able to look at this situation not just as an issue of we have more than we need so we can help somebody else, which is really important. That's compassion. That's mercy. It's a wonderful thing. But then there's other things where we say, this is an injustice. We see it especially around children. When a child grows up in an environment where they're abused, when girls, for example, are forced into sexual exploitation, young boys as well in in parts of the world, that's not, we're not reaching out to them just because we're compassionate. That's an injustice that has to be addressed. And injustice also tends to challenge us to look at what's the system, what are the root causes of this, that will, it will continue, to, we can go and help children, it, it's a bit of the old analogy, if you see babies floating down the river, and you go out and rescue the babies, and they keep floating down the river, at some point you want to say, what's going on upstream here, right, what's going on? We've got to stop that, it isn't enough just to rescue the babies, we have to stop what's causing it. So that's the other part of being a global Christian that's very demanding because sometimes it gets political. People don't always agree on this stuff. But that's not an excuse that we should be looking as carefully as we can to see how we're addressing injustice. And in your work, in Zvang Fei, that you there's injustice there. No question about it. I, I like to suggest that in our, the work that we're doing, three things. Some of this is taken from Micah 6.8. Uh, First of all, there has to be a place for outrage. That's probably the thing that surprises people the most. A place for mercy and a place for humility. 
Now, the place of outrage, what, what I mean by that is we have to get worked up sometimes. You've got to feel some passion. You know, so for, let me just, there's a story, a little girl named uh, Ka. She's a Cambodian girl. She was born into poverty. This happens so frequently in Cambodia. She's in a poor family. Somebody goes to her mother and says, hey, we can get your daughter a job as a maid working in a house. And so the mother, usually, in some cases, there's commission on this, but usually it's just naivete. The mother says, fine. And Ka is one of these little girls that gets caught up, goes off to the city, and it's not being a maid, it's prostitution. And so she was taken, thrown into a locked brothel for months, over a year. No, not even daylight for her in that brothel. She was one of the fortunate ones. There was a raid on the brothel. And the girls like her were all freed. She was taken to our uh, recovery. We have a trauma recovery center in Cambodia. And it's a safe haven where all the things that are required, everything from, you know, health care, medicine, counseling, vocational training, because these girls, these girls are in many ways shamed almost for life. So you're trying to figure out a way to help them uh, rehabilitate. Uh, one of the Favorite thing she likes to do, you'll see a picture here, she's writing in her journal. Just keeping her thoughts. One of the most important things in recovery is expressing these things, not sitting on them and hiding them and hoping they'll go away. And then in this next picture, she, it, might, it seems a little counterintuitive to us, but generally they can't go back to their family right away because they're, if, the, if in any way her family was involved in getting her into the prostitution, she can't go back. Uh, on the other hand, we also have to be sure she's getting proper uh, treatment and care. So in this case, uh, Ka had been away for actually two or three years, I believe, as I recall. But here she is with her mother, being reunited with her mother and being able to go back with her family again. These things are outrageous. And, they, and we, we need to have some passion about this and say this isn't right. There's also a place for mercy and forgiveness in this kind of work. Always we, we should be merciful. She, we should express forgiveness because that's what God's done for us. And so all we're trying to do, we're trying to act, we're trying to follow God's example to be forgivers of others, to extend forgiveness to them. I've got, I think there's a picture up here now. I just thought I'd give you, this is more of a Canadian, uh, a Canadian story. Uh, I go to a church, uh, an evangelical Anglican church in Ontario. The picture here is our church. Our 150-year-old church, year old church on fire. We had started to uh, add on to it, and a couple of boys broke into it. I, we don't have any evidence they intended to burn it down, but they were playing around. The, the steeple was left and then a few walls, and then we'd started to do renovation and build new buildings around it. And one of them just threw, I think they were smoking, and he just threw a match into a bit of uh, tar paper and set the whole thing on fire, burned the whole thing down in a matter of, you know, two hours. Uh, and, of course, we were devastated, as any church would be, when you lose that structure, even though we know that, you know, the church isn't ultimately about structure, but those things matter to us, especially an old one. So what do we do? What do we do? We had some pretty angry parishioners. Uh, the choice, I mean, if we wanted to be really ornery about it, we could probably try and do everything we could to get this kid, you know, thrown into jail and, and off... And, but our, our concern was he'll pr it pr might make it worse, not better. So we, did, we even consulted an ethics professor at Fuller Seminary to get some advice. And what finally happened is the judge uh, said, you're going to have to do three things. You're going to have to put up the chairs every Sunday in the school that they're now meeting in. It took us like three years to get this all sorted out. You have to give 10% of your allowance money or whatever it is to the church and then thirdly, this was the biggie, you have to publicly apologize to the church. And he, this guy was a little bit of a delinquent, and, uh, so, and he'd been in a music group, so he was kind of cocky about the, you know, I sing, so I'm sure I can handle that, it's not a big deal. Well, he was setting up chairs, he was paying his money in, and so then the big day came for the, uh, for the uh, confession. And so it was an incredible experience. It was an incredible experience. He got up there, you know, he'd prepared his little talk, and he probably got three lines into it, and the emotion just took over. And he started to cry, begged forgiveness, and went through the whole thing, and many of the parishioners came up and hugged him and, 
you know, said, we forgive you and wished him well. It was the right thing to do. Unfortunately, just to tell the whole story, I can't say that we changed his life that profoundly. He's still out there, and as my, my understanding is, he still hasn't really made a, you know, a commitment. But the point is, we did what we thought was the right thing, to practice in the midst of this forgiveness, forgiveness and mercy. One of the most powerful stories that I, that I have is, uh, you'll see this next slide. Of, uh, it's a story of two men in Rwanda, the Rwanda genocide. I'm amazed at the forgiveness in some of these contexts. It just blows your mind how people can forgive. There were two men. One man had been uh, almost killed on three occasions by the other man. He miraculously escaped. The last time they threw, he'd been whacked with a machete and thrown into a pile of bodies, and he crawled out and lived. This man that did this to him was found, thrown into jail, and the fellow who was the victim went to the prison after a year or two and went and spoke to him and said that he forgave him. So I was talking to these two guys sitting side by side on a bench 10 years later on the anniversary of the genocide, and he's telling me this story. Just amazing. Because this man had killed members of his family as well, not just attempted murder of this guy. I asked him, I said, how do you do this? He was really simple. He said, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. And then he said, because it was the 10th anniversary, but he said, it's very hard. Very hard. That's what it means when you go places that are tough. The place of humility in our work. I, I was in Pakistan. It's sort of a story about me. The country was underwater. We were doing flooding response and we were racing around doing food distributions. We had vehicles. And I just remember this. Some, some, every once in a while, God just kind of gets your heart. We were racing around, and I looked outside of us as we were turning a corner. It was like 100 degrees. Uh, no, not 100 degrees, sorry. It was like 35 degrees and about 95% humidity. He was an older man, and he was, he was pulling a cart. And his eyes just turned to me. He didn't say anything or whatever, but I could just see he was, he was just working with everything he had to look after his family. And here I was, an aid worker, sitting in a vehicle, riding around. We were doing important things. But it just reminded me again of how we need to be sensitive of the environment that we're in and how we behave. It's, it, you, you have to be humble. We're going to go places that are uncomfortable. Places that are very uncomfortable. And that's part of this. A story, a story of, a, of our leader in Afghanistan going to visit the police chief in this particular area trying to build a relationship. And earlier that day, they'd executed, he had executed a woman who had had an inappropriate relationship. She was beheaded in the city square. And Wynn was saying to me, what do you do? What do you do? He decided in the end he would go, he would respect, but he said it was one of the most difficult things he's ever had to do, to be a Jesus follower when such grave injustice has been done. That's the context. This next picture, it's a slide, it's from CBC News. It, you can't, it, it, the, it's the title. Do countries lose religion as they gain wealth? And it, there's dots on this little chart. The dots at the top are level of religiosity, and the dots on the, on the bottom uh, part of the graph are income. So the dots way over here on the chart Way over here, that's countries like us. High levels of income, but low religion adherence. And so what the article is saying, when people get more affluence, they actually have less interest in religion, in faith. And so my, this is my argument, why I pulled that article for you. That's why it's so important for us to be engaged with the poor. 
It isn't just that we need to, to help the poor, but working with the poor reminds us who we are and how broken we are and how critical that is to our transformation. And that's why it's so important, I believe, on this whole issue of justice and transformation that we remain engaged with people that aren't like us because we start breaking down those barriers. So, and the more affluent we get, I believe the more critical that is. Because the bad news is, there's less, the bad news is, yes, we're helping a lot of people, we're making a lot of difference, but there's still pockets of poverty in every place in the world, almost. And we know that so well here in Canada. And that's why I commend you as a church, not only are you engaging in Laos, but you're also engaging in your community here. We, we can't just be stuck in these walls. We have to go beyond. Well, I, I was talking to our staff, and I, it, the, the other thing about being a global Christian always comes back to what I call the big why. Why do we do this? Why do we do this? Why do we, we, it's, we tell the stories of children who are broken. We tell stories of injustice. We scream out at it. We go after every nook and cranny to gain a foothold for the plight of the poor in our country, in our churches, in our world. We're broken by this reality. We have to do hard things. But I, want, I, I believe very strongly that's what makes us real Christians. That's the part. Not that God wants us to suffer, but that's where God is. That's where God's presence is. And I don't know about you, but I, th this is what I, I said to them. I, I said, I actually believe that I will stand before God and give an account of what I did for the least ones, the little ones, the prisoners, the naked, and the starving, the one that's even marginalized in my own family. What do I do with them? I believe it's true, but honestly, I don't know how God's going to do that. I don't know the details. It's terrifying to me. But what keeps me sane is God says he's a God of grace. And that somehow, I don't know if it's going to be where all of our sins are all of a sudden before us and we'll all be weeping and wailing, or whether that won't even happen. God will have already thrown them in the sea. I don't know how it's going to work. And the bad people are, well, how is this all going to work? We just know that we're accountable. And that's what fighting injustice, in my view, is all about. about it's about the deep anguish and compassion that we feel for the poor. And then I've, I've got a quote that I like here. I'm jumping ahead a little bit for you on the slides. It's a quote, Our burden for the poor can never be greater than our joy of the Lord. That's the loving God piece, making sure that keeps strong. Yes, we have a burden, but we also should have joy. There has to be joy here. And I, I, as I was thinking about the joy, just kind of a funny little anecdote. When I was early on in my work with World Vision, I went to Kenya and we, we were in the midst of some discussion with people that I didn't think spoke English because they were talking in uh, uh, Swahili back and forth. And I said to the one fellow, I said, how do you say hello? I meant, you know, how do you say hello in your language? He said, hello. <laughs> so so there, there has to be some humor in this as well. And uh, it always makes you humble. All right, well, I'm sort of about out of time here. I think I'm going to be in trouble. Let me close with one story. This is one of my favorite stories. This happened a few years ago in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Yes. And the young man in the top there, his name is Eric. At that time, he was 16. It's a few years ago now. He was a former child soldier. He got abducted at the age of 8 and escaped at the age of 12. He went back to his community. It's a regional community called Beni. Lots of soldiers around, lots of unrest. And he got together with about 50, 75 other teenagers, and they formed a children's parliament. They're all Christian kids, and they weren't happy and satisfied with what was going on in their community. They're an example of young people taking, doing it. So they got together, and they said, okay, what are the things that are wrong with our community? The first thing they said, there was an abandoned baby in the community, and it was going to be put in an orphanage. And the kids said, this isn't right. This baby needs to be adopted. So they went around to their parents. They talked to the, uh, to the uh, mayor and said, this isn't right. They got this little baby adopted. Second thing, a lot of brothels because there's lots of military around and a lot of teenage girls being coerced into prostitution. 
And so they went to the, to the uh, chief of police. They went to the mayor, and they said, this is wrong. This has got to come to a stop, and we are going to be demonstrating on this until it stops. I talked to the officials when I was there. They said uh, prostitution had decreased by uh, 90% because of what these kids had done. The next thing they tackled, girls, teenage girls, generally after school would have to go get water because it was a bit far away from their community. They would walk, and they were getting assaulted, and in some cases raped. So the older boys in the children's parliament said, we are going to be chaperones. And they divided up two by two, and I was told by the leadership in the community they have not had any assault against girls in the last two years because of what these kids had done. The last thing were, there were, was there was nine young people, teenagers, that were homeless. And they were consistently being thrown into jail with adult prisoners. And so these kids went to the, chief of, or the uh, warden of the prison and said, this is a violation of children's rights. You cannot do this. They got the kids out of school and... I'm sorry, got them out of prison, got them fo put into foster families, and they're all in school now. That's what can happen. That's what, what can happen when people really make a difference. My, my next, I guess, and last slide is a little boy named Ryan. He's eight years old, or it was four years old when I, we took this picture. He came to us, wanted to buy a, uh, a cow for a family in India. And so he, he made a deal with his parents he said, if I can raise the $700, do I get to shave my head bald? So he came back to me about four months later. He raised $1,000. He shaved his head, and he's now 11 years old. He's raised $10,000. The last time I saw him, he came in with his head shaved. His dad had kind of like a mohawk, and his mother had green hair. They, they, the deal was they all had to go to church that way. All right. Okay, the next slide, I don't think I have time for it, but I'll just give you the thought. If you had one year to live, one year left to live, what would you want to do? What would you want to be able to say at the end of 12 months, this is what I've done to help the poor? What would that look like? Well, I thank you for being on this journey of justice and compassion. Uh, once again, I want to congratulate you for what you're already doing. I know I'm talking to people who share... Uh, share what I'm speaking about. My, my hope is this. I think I can say this with confidence because God created us this way. I hope your virus to care, your virus to do justice, never wanes, and it's with you till the day you die. Because Jesus wants us, wants us to be part of bringing a touch of his heaven and his recreation now on earth, not just when he comes back. Because right now, there's a little girl somewhere who's wondering where her next meal's going to come from. There's a mother who's by in front of an old shack somewhere, living with her children. She's inside, and somebody's pounding on the door to wreak havoc. There's a father somewhere sitting under a tree, ashamed because he can't get work and he can't care for his children. That's the world that Jesus wants us to be part of. Thank you, and God bless you.